It's been quarter of a century already. The wounds are still open and sore. Srebrenica genocide, the worst atrocity on the European soil since World War II, leaves us divided even to this day. With a great honor, I would like to welcome one of the loudest voices, I'm not mistaken, if I say probably the most crucial voice out there when it comes to the dark times called the 1990s Balkans. CNN's international correspondent Christian Amanpour is joining us from London right now. Christian, welcome to the program. Ika, it's good to be with you, especially to talk about 25 years since the massacre at Srebrenica. Thank you, Christian. There are so many unanswered questions. And even if we do try to answer those difficult questions, I'd like to call them the obvious questions. Um, somehow the context is misunderstood or interpreted in the way each person chooses to interpret them for themselves. This is why I felt it's really important to try to find these answers with you, someone who stands for truth and impartiality. Christian, last year you have dedicated a piece to Srebrenica called The Srebrenica Genocide was a defining moment. Now, what did you mean by that and who made concern? Well, Ika, the war in Bosnia was a defining moment for our generation and was the most defining moment uh, in terms of Western collective security since World War II. Many generations grew up on the idea and the imperative, the moral imperative, of that slogan, never again, after what happened to the Jews and others who were killed during World War II. Six million people perished and there was a terrible war to make sure that ideology, the Nazi ideology, did not triumph in the end and was beaten back. And there was a denazification process. And as I say, never again was the context in which I came and my generation came to Bosnia when the war broke out. And we could not believe what we were witnessing. We were witnessing not just a war, but we quickly understood that we were witnessing an ethnic cleansing and a genocide. And we had to put it in context, call it for what it was, not make any false equivalences either in fact or in or in morality and just tell the truth and by doing that we became participants i suppose in the story but what we were doing was bearing witness and that was the most vital thing that we could do because never again was happening in the 90s in the balkans which is in europe which you know just more than a decade ago had hosted um the the winter olympics so it was a big deal, and what happened there in Sarajevo, in, in all the cities and towns and villages, including, of course, finally in Srebrenica, defined our generation and how we look at collective security and, of course, the moral thing to do. And we have to mention, when you already mentioned never again, um, Rwanda happened a year prior to Srebrenica, then Srebrenica happened, and we said never again. But we see again that this is happening again. Now we can mention Myanmar uh, and the minority, Muslim minority Rohingya. When is never again really never again? Well, Ika, that's a very good question. And, you know, despite the fact that we bear witness to the truth, we show the pictures, we talk to the victims and to all sides, we get the story, we are journalists, and there are many others, human rights organizations, NGOs, um, you know, activists, many others try to get the truth out. It comes down in the end to political leadership and political will. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I may not have understood that as much um, in, in the 90s in Bosnia. I understood, of course, that the great powers refused to intervene. Uh, the United States, Britain, France, no country wanted to intervene. And they gave us this mantra that all sides are equally guilty, that this is centuries of ethnic hatred, and we can't do anything about it. Well, we knew that that wasn't the whole story, that all sides were not equally guilty, that there had been uh, as much living in harmony as there had been um, conflict in those centuries of, of ethnic rivalry. And so we didn't buy that story and we tried to tell the truth. And I would say that, you know, clearly the intervention of the world was too late. 
it clearly, you know, three years into the war, and it took that final and terrible massacre at Srebrenica to concentrate the minds of democracies who had built the post-World War II uh, landscape and who sought to export their values of democracy and freedom and ethnic tolerance and religious pluralism and, and all of that around the world, and yet they weren't prepared to defend it even in Europe's backyard. And so, you know, finally they did intervene. And because we would not let these democracies any longer hide their faces from the wholesale slaughter of civilians, I think we also had a preemptive effect in Kosovo, that the world decided to intervene in Kosovo before it became a full-blown genocide. So that's on the positive side of what we can do by raising you know, awareness and, and the truth. Again, way too late. But you mentioned exactly Rwanda, when there wasn't a tipping point of journalism there, when the world again didn't want to intervene, when the Security Council could not come up with a unified uh, action or strategy and just left it, and we saw the result there. Nearly a million people in Rwanda killed on the basis of their ethnicity and their religion in under three months. I mean, just think about it. And so that's the dark side. Now, in between, it takes political leadership. And you're absolutely right. Even today, as you know better than I do because you're living there, the war is over in the Balkans, in Bosnia, but the peace is not cemented. It, and there's so much cemented. and so far to go still. And I will take you to that moment. But before we go there, I would like to take you to two defining moments of the 90s in the Balkans, your moments. Uh, first of all, 1995, you met then general and now the convicted war criminal Ratko Mladic. Uh, what did you think of him? Uh, how did he seem to you? Did you feel any fear? as a person knowing that something bad was going to happen back then? I think I always felt a, a chill. Certainly when I met Ratko Mladic, uh, I won't even say general, just Ratko Mladic. Um, and I felt a chill also when I met Radovan Karadzic and all of those people who were embodying and, and uh, you know, fighting that evil ideology, uh, fighting for that e evil I ideology, implementing that evil ideology. Of course, I felt a chill. Um, and yes, I felt fear because, as you know, Bosnia was the first war where uh, the participants, and mostly the Bosnian Serbs, targeted journalists deliberately. Bosnia was the first war in which journalists were not just caught in the crossfire. They were deliberately targeted and deliberately killed and injured, including many of my colleagues, in order to shut us up, in order to silence the messenger. In many of our previous wars, well, wars before I was covering them, but the, my colleagues who covered Vietnam and, 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 and all of that generation, you know, they were welcomed on the battlefield by all sides because all sides believed that the journalists could get their side out and tell their story. But something changed in the Balkans, and we were also considered by those who had the overwhelming military superiority and the political agenda of ethnic cleansing and genocide that we were also part of the problem. They didn't want you know, the truth to get out. It was the mm -hmm. precursor of the attack on journalists that now we see, you know, journalists are being attacked for fake news and all the rest of it. So, yeah, um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, but I wasn't intimidated and it didn't stop me telling the truth of what was going on. Takes a lot of courage. Takes a lot of courage to, to do that. That's why the reporters voices are so important for the truth. Um, you recalled uh, in your testimony to see Mladic sit before the court in The Hague facing justice was deeply satisfying. And watching him hear his verdict well, yes. was satisfying for you. Yes, because it's a matter of accountability. And if you believe in human rights and if you believe in justice, there has to be accountability. There is no justice without accountability. Um, the slogans that you hear on the streets right now, whether, you know, obviously starting in the United States and in, in, in Europe and many of the other countries which are taking up the Black Lives Matter, anti-racism uh, uprising, it's called no justice, no peace. 
And that's not just a slogan. And again, you all know it better than I do, because there still isn't full justice in Bosnia. There still isn't full justice for the bereaved mothers and widows of Srebrenica, who, as you know, many of them still languish outside their village, outside Srebrenica in Tuzla. Uh, many of them are living hand to mouth in poverty in, in, in not in their own homes, some in camps. You know, you've also got a continued nationalist uh, uh, political agenda uh, in your neighbor there, uh, part of the uh, of the entity uh, in the Bosnian Serbs, you have still you know problems between Serbia and Kosovo. Um, so full political um, stability has not been reached, and most certainly full justice has not. But, but some has, and the most responsible, the key figures who conceived and implemented this reign of terror have been brought to justice in The Hague. And for me, that is what's satisfying, not on a personal level, on a human rights and on a accountability level. But is the justice met if today in the Balkans we still see division over this matter? Now the streets, schools, entire communities are named by convicted war criminals in order to preserve their so-called legacy. Now the highest politicians, highest Political leaders are denying genocide and refusing to call it what it is. And I'll include several names. President of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic. Serbian Prime Minister Anna Brnabic. Member of Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Milorad Dodik. Which is obviously the last stage of genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we also see glorifying genocide by certain communities and certain groups. No, I do not think that the terrible crime, massacre in Srebrenica, was a genocide. You must know that unless you take this step, the chances of you joining the European Union are very slim, aren't they? I No, I don't know that. We, because it was a hideous crime. It was a war crime. I am not happy because of it. It wasn't done in the name of Serbian people. And Serbian cannot, Ser, Serbs cannot be collectively uh, uh, be blamed for what happened there. Two courts, the International Criminal Tribunal for, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice, both ruled that it was genocide. Okay. And you won't accept it. I do not think it was a genocide. You're rewriting history, aren't you? Trying to rewrite history. I do not think it was a genocide. I think it was, but let, let me just say, it seems like, you know, I'm, um, you know, uh, I think it was, it was, a terrible, terrible crime. But genocide is basically when you are, genocide is when you are, uh, you know, the killing the entire population, the wi women, children, and this was not that case. I don't agree that Bosnians have the right to look at the history of the past as they think. But I don't agree that it is korektno ako neko nama želi da nametne bilo kako mišljenje. Dakle, i Britanija je pokrenula inicijativu u Savjetu bezbednosti da se Srbi proglase narod, genocidnim narodom u prošlom vijeku. Rusija je stavila vetu. Ja moram, ja to poštim. Hvala Putin. Hvala Putinu za to. Ima to isto vremeno vrijeđa ne. Bošnjake. Ne vrijeđa, zašto vrijeđa? Jer se pozivaju na odluke Ma, izvinite, molim. Haškog tribunala pa, i Međunarodnog inicijativa... u Srebrenici bio genocid. Britanska inicijativa nije bio genocid. Britanska inicijativa vrijeđa Srbe, zato što je postavljena kao tako. Gospodine Dodik, može to se i tako posmatrati? Ko je pravi Milorad Dodik? Onaj koji je ovaj koga govorio vidi. da se u Srebrenici desio genocid. A, opet ista priča. Nije ista priča, hoću ja vas ovo da pitam. A, da Radko Mladić i Radovan Karadžić treba da idu u Hag ili onaj Dodik za koga su Mladić i Karadžić heroji i koji kaže ja da, da se u Srebrenici nije desio genocid. Ja priznajem da sam imao neki rani e, pori povjerenja u međunarodnu zajednicu. Kad sam se uvjerio da su to obično špekulanti, a značajan broj njih oštapleri koji su ovdje e, pokušali da nam nametnu neke istine, onda sam naravno i promijenio svoj stav o tom. U Srebrenicu sam otišao da bih se poklonio žrtvama. Da bih rekao koliko je to stravično delo. I ne samo kao Aleksandar Vučić što bih imao ljudsku odgovornost. Već i kao predsjednik vlade. Ja ne, ja ne volim te velike reči Izvinite, ovakvi ili onakvi, to su drugi ovi marketing političari, stručnjaci. Ali sam otišao i pognuo sam glavu tog dana. 
samo na jednom mestu, ispred spomenika tim žrtvama. Nisam pognuo glavu kad su poletele flaše, kamenice i pesnice kameni. Ni jednog sekunda, ako ste primetili. Za razliku čak i od dobrog dela ljudi iz obezbeđenja koji mahinalno je da sagnu glavu. Ja je nisam sagnuo. Jer je moja poruka bila, neću da je sagnem tu, nego tamo gde sam nameravao. A pognuo sam glavu pred žrtvama i srebrenice. Ovo sam mogao da pokažem koliko hoćete hrabrosti i da se nimalo nisam uplašio. Ja mislim da sam time uradio veliku stvar za svakoga ko to razume. Dolazimo do pravne kvalifikacije dela. Ja, od kada sam predsednik vlade, nisam rekao ni da jeste, ni da nije. Nisam ulazio u to. Nisam želeo da povredim ni jednog bošnjaka da mu kažem to nije to. Nisam želeo da govorim jeste upravo da ne bih izazvao dodatne sukobe i trvenje u Srbiji i da ne bih eventualno napravio drugu vrstu greške. Dobro, evo, gospodin Izadbović kaže da očekuje od vas da kažete ono, da potvrdite zapravo ono što je već proglasio Međunarodni sud pravde, a to je da se u Srebrenici ne se ugenuci. Dakle, ja sam to očekivao i nemojte da danas gosta što kažu satirujemo u ugao. Nemam problem, ja sam rekao što mogu po tom pitanju. How do you comment on that and what and how and when does reconciliation really come? Well, look, it's a travesty, obviously. Uh, Any time you deny a genocide or, or gross violations of human rights, international humanitarian law, even though they have been adjudicated at an impartial criminal tribunal set up by the United Nations, then there's a problem. It's, it's a political agenda. It's a nationalist agenda. And we are seeing a rise, and certainly we have, and maybe in my generation and in my you know, working career, um, what happened in the Balkans after the fall of communism was the first real uh, evidence of, 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 a, of, a, of a war of nationalism. So that, that, that's what happened. And obviously, we're seeing nationalist politics now all over the world. The United States is led by a nationalist populist. Britain's government is headed by a pop populist nationalist. Um, you know, and you can go all over. Hungary, you can, you can, you can pick your place, uh, even in democracies. Uh, so, you know, it's a project that, that we haven't reached the end yet. Um, a lot of it also depends on economic uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. If young people feel that there's no hope um, and they don't have the opportunity to, you know, give their youth and their, you know, more modern thoughts and their work and their lives to building up a democratic nation of their own and feel that they have to leave in order to find jobs, if there's this kind of brain drain in somewhere as crucial as, as the Balkans, it's going to add to this calamity. Uh, but I think the only thing we can do is just keep trying and keep trying to keep the attention on and keep the accountability and, and keep trying to fight for justice and just hope that those who become elected as the years go on, it's a long, long, generations long project. Just look at Germany. Now that we're seeing in Germany, for instance, stories about how after the Second World War, obviously there was a massive denazification pro process. There was also a massive help from the United States called the Marshall Plan. And they built the most robust democracy in Europe mm -hmm. out of the ashes of that fascism, that murderous fascism. They also had to completely re, uh, reform their police, uh, their, their police force, their police and security force. But it's a project that took decades, decades. And leadership. And, and I know leadership. that we're 25 years on from Srebrenica. Well, of course, leadership. That's what I was trying to get out when I talked about the young. That's where the hope is. That's where the hope is. I would like to take you now a year prior, Srebrenica genocide. And this is one of the most remarkable televised events that happened in history, I believe. And this is when you tuned in from Sarajevo in 1994 uh, into the president's, Clinton's presidential mm -hmm. debate and asked him straightforward what we call the killer question. And that was, Mr. President, how long will U.S. flip-flop tendencies in Bosnia take reflecting on Bill Clinton's foreign policies. Uh, now, that was quite an awkward moment for President Clinton. Was it, was it uh, something that you actually planned on asking or it was just some kind of a human plead for help from Sarajevo? 
Well, it was a reaction, Ika. It was a reaction. I'm a journalist. I was listening to what he was saying, and he was busy bigging up America's contribution to what was going on in Sarajevo and around, around Bosnia. And I was getting more and more upset because myself and my colleagues were on the ground seeing that, yes, they may have been sending pallets of food and other you know, humanitarian supplies in a city, by the way, that was still besieged, a medieval siege in the middle or at the end of the 20th century, televised around the world 24-7 by the most sophisticated you know, satellite communications in history. And I was seeing the disconnect between bigging up that and the war that was still going on and the civilians who were still being slaughtered. So it wasn't something planned, and it wasn't intended as disrespectful or even an attack. It was the most sensible, honest question I could ask. What and we I say, asked what him, we say the don't you think question, your right? constant flip-flops on Bosnia... Well, yeah, don't you think your constant flip-flops, which were f constant, on Bosnia have sent a dangerous signal and set a dangerous precedent and empower those who do have an agenda and a plan even if you don't. That was the nub of my question. And of course he was very cross, and of course he snapped back at me. Um, and then afterwards he was, you know, he softened the tone, and, um, you know, he, he, I think, you know... Diplomatically uh, yeah, tried to answer he, the question. Yeah, he, he realized that I asked the... Yeah, yeah, and so, what, the, you know, I remember it, you know, it, it certainly gave me chills. I do remember for many years after that, every leader or person I came to interview would always say, Madam, because the President Clinton had said, there have been no constant flip-flops, Madam. And um, so I was Madam for a long time after that. Um, but in the end, uh, although I could have been fired, I could have been whatever, um, I, I was honest. And I asked the right question as far as I could. And what else can I do? And my objective is not to be liked by the powerful and the mighty. My objective is to get to the truth and to hold the powerful accountable and to you know, bear witness. And, I, and I, I do believe that Bosnia taught me a fundamental lesson. You uh, said in your, that you said objectivity in your report is not about neutrality. Mm -hmm. You said that as a young reporter, Bosnia is where I found my voice. That was your, that was the sentence that actually struck me as a young reporter right now, looking up to you. And conflicts and witnessing atrocities as a reporter changes you in a way. How has Bosnia changed you in a way? Well, first of all, it was a defining moment in my career and in my life, personally and professionally. But it was a defining moment for Europe and for the whole world. And I was, in a way, professionally very fortunate to have that, that story, your story, as my first encounter with this kind of, of, of travesty. And I learned a lot there about human dignity, about, as I said, human rights, about the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do, and about how to recognize what I was actually seeing. And that came to me by being criticized by those who did not want to intervene in Bosnia. I was criticized for taking a side and, and being on the side of one side. Well, you know, all journalists tend to uh, be on the side of the underdog and, in other words, tell their story. It's not necessarily be on the side. It's just you tell the story. You tell everybody's story. Uh, but, um, you know, when people are being massacred, it's clearly a very mm -hmm. painful mm -hmm. thing for the world to look at and not respond. So the easiest attack is, oh, you're not being objective, you're not telling the truth, you're just, you know, got, you know, etc. So I said, um, Objectivity, which is our golden rule and should be, means telling all sides of the story. But it does not mean falsely creating an equivalence where it doesn't exist. In this case, there were victims and there were aggressors, and we said it. And finally, the proof was in the pudding. The world came in and stopped the aggressors. After the massacre at Srebrenica, they very quickly punctured a hole in the paper tiger there were no casualties amongst the allies who did that. There was no, it, it took two weeks. They then launched a diplomatic process and we haven't had war in the Balkans since. 
Now, it's was not it, perfect. Was it in your it opinion too late? It just the flimsiness of their argument not to intervene. Was well, it I said that at the beginning. Of course, it was too late. But it was... Uh, one last question. I, I know said that are, at the beginning. It was yeah, too late. It was too late. Uh, one last question, and I don't want to get too personal, but But when I you really say too wonder, late, it was late. It was late, but never too late because there are still lives saved in the end and the war stopped. And that was important, that no more children, no more innocent people were getting killed. Um, I don't want to get too personal, but I do have to ask this question, uh, one question that my colleagues and I myself struggle with when we are in difficult situations. Did you ever cry, Christian, um, in your private time when seeing something like that, when going through Bosnian war? Um, did, you, did you ever sit back and cry? I certainly cried a lot. I'm not sure whether I did actually in the moment because, you know, when you have to work, I, I, I used to describe it as being an emergency room doctor, an intensive care emergency room doctor, where if you lose your, if you lose it, you're no good to anybody. If you're a doctor, you're no good to your patient. And if you're a journalist, you're no good to your team. And you're no good to the story and to the truth that you're trying to tell. So for sure, it was very emotional for me um, many, 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 many times, um, particularly when I you know, would tell the stories of children, mm -hmm. women, in innocent civilians, old men, you know, all those people who were blamelessly targeted. And they were. They were war crimes and violations of international humanitarian law, but they were also very personally difficult to witness and to absorb. And so, yes, the answer is yes, but did I fall about on the job? No, I didn't, because then mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done my job properly. Mm -hmm. uh, are we seeing you in Bosnia and Herzegovina sometime soon? I hope so. I always love coming back. Well, uh, we hope to see you in Bosnia soon, and Bosnia definitely loves you. Christian, thank you very much for your time, and it was such an honor to have you on our show. Thank you, Ike. It was my pleasure. Thank you. CNN's international correspondent Christian Amamper joined us tonight from London. We discussed dark times of the 1990s in the Balkans. More than 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys were killed after Bosnian Serb forces attacked Srebrenica in July 1995, despite the presence of Dutch troops meant to act as international peacekeepers. The denial and glorification as the last stage of genocide is still present here. Where do we go from here? Where do our children go from here? I will leave you to answer those questions for yourselves. I'm N1's Ika Ferrer-Gotic. Thank you for watching.